Hello, I'm Eugene Chausovsky, a senior Eurasia analyst at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, our premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. If it's a case where it's total stranger, you can get away with murder, and these abductions you know, makes it extremely difficult for law enforcement. In our morgues, I know when I was in the Bureau, it was tens of thousands of unidentified dead. We don't even know who these people are. Welcome to the Stratfor Podcast. I'm Faisal Pervez. How can we get ahead of crazy if we don't know how crazy thinks? If you watch the Netflix series Mindhunter, you may know that line. It explains why the two lead characters do what they do. And what they do is interview serial killers to solve crimes. The show is loosely based on the work and experiences of the real-life original Mindhunter, John Douglas, who pioneered criminal profiling for the FBI. John Douglas is no longer working for the FBI, and it's been 20 years since he wrote his original book, Mindhunter. But Douglas continues to dig into his case files to share what he's learned about criminal behavior. His latest offering is The Killer Across the Table, co-written with Mark Olshaker. Both recently called into the Stratford studio to share secrets with their chief security officer, Fred Burton. Let's listen in. Hi, I'm Fred Burton here today with John Douglas and Mark Olshaker, who have written the killer across the table, unlocking the secrets of serial killers and predators with the FBI's original mine hunter. John Mark, welcome to Stratfor Talks. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks, Fred. John, I was fascinated in reading The Killer Across the Table in the theory of why plus how equals who when you're hunting for a serial killer. Could you explain to our audience what that means? Well, generally we have the uh a um, unknown subject case uh, on sub we're trying to figure out of course who done it so what you're looking at is is you do victimology you, uh, analyze the victim to see whether she was a victim of opportunity or there was uh, the offender specifically targeted that victim for a, a for a reason um, you're also looking at the forensic evidence uh, going over the materials the photographs um, interviewing the forensic pathologist if one was uh, you know, was involved. So it, it's Y plus how equals who. So when I came back to Quantico uh, in the late late 70s, um, I, I saw a need. We, re, we were starting to teach classes in criminal psychology, uh, but the way that we're being taught, kind of like the way they're following the show of Mindhunter in season one uh, with my, my character, uh, they were presenting cases, but they really didn't have the background information, uh, the instructors at Quantico, FBI agents. And they were being challenged in the classroom. And so looking at that, I, I, I want to understand, you know, the, the wise, the wise of, of, say, Charles Manson, uh, David Burke, which is the son of Sam. So let's go into the prisons. And because we know who did it, let's, let's go ask them. And it just seems so obvious to me uh, to do something you know, like that. The, the Bureau uh, you know, was against, uh, against me doing that. They couldn't understand why I, I would do something. You know, like that. And, and that's how I really, I, I did it basically as survival mode to become a, a good instructor at Quantico. Little, little did I know that this would uh, c- create a program within the FBI and then a unit. And today it's a unit with about five subunits within it. So it's grown significantly. Mark, talk to me a little bit about the killer across the table. Why these four subjects in this book? Well, I think what happened is uh, after the first season of Mindhunter on Netflix, where uh, the show took a deep dive into what John and his colleagues had started doing, uh, interviewing serial killers and violent predators in prisons and penitentiaries to try to figure out what was going through their minds before during and after the commission of their crimes so that they could relate that information and that insight to the evidence they found at the crime scene. We found there was a lot of interest in that from uh, from viewers and readers. So we decided it was time to take a deep dive 
into that process itself that John developed that uh, really gave the initial insight into what became behavioral profiling and John's form of criminal investigative analysis. And so what we just tried to do was take four cases that John had done since he left the Bureau when he uh, was a consultant. And each one is different, and they're not as well known as the earlier cases of Charles Manson or Ed Kemper or David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. The first one is a man named Joseph McGowan, who is not like your typical uh, killer. He was a high school science teacher in New Jersey, uh, well-respected, very well invested in the community. And when a seven-year-old Girl Scout, uh, Brownie actually, who uh, who lived around the corner from him, came to uh, collect $2 that uh, he owed for uh, buying two boxes of Girl Scout cookies, uh, when John interviewed him in prison in New Jersey, he said, John, as soon as she rang the doorbell and I looked at her through the screen door, I knew I was going to kill her. On the other hand, uh, we study people like Joseph Condro, who raped and murdered uh, teenage girls, but instead of used doing strangers, he thought it would be easier and to rape and murder the daughters of his friends because they trusted him. We talk also in the book about a man named Donald Harvey, who may be one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. Uh, this guy killed close to 100 people over a period of years, and nobody even noticed because he was working at a hospital, and people didn't realize that these were unnatural deaths. To show the range of, uh, of the discipline and what John and his colleagues learned from them. When you look at the success that uh, John, you and Mark have had, and Mark, this question's for you, uh, what is the challenge with keeping this kind of uh, series going forward? Of course, we're always looking for new material, but John, what have you done, about 5,000 cases in your career so far? Probably 5,000 plus while in the Bureau than since I retired from the from the the FBI. And it's not all just serial murder cases. A lot of people think that's all I did or my unit uh, did. We did uh, from rape cases, child abductions, various kidnapping cases, product tampering, bombing, terrorism, extortion, bombing, yeah. arson, yeah, um, and different, provided different kinds of services too. Sometimes uh, if you're targeting someone, I had a public corruption cases where uh, we're targeting people, what would be the best approach? So you, you're doing more of an assessment determining how that approach uh, should be made, who should make the approach. Sometimes the case agent is not the best person to be doing the, uh, the approach or the, the interview interrogation of, uh, of, of a subject. So uh, through the various shows, they think, you know, that's all you do. And, and the other thing is, it's that you're more or less a coach. Uh, you reach a point where you're not doing all the interviews of, in these cases. You can't, you can't possibly do it. So you're, you're coaching, you're coaching, agents or police, whoever's going to be involved you know, in the case. And maybe you're providing, for example, you're having difficulty coming up with an analysis, a profile of the offender. So you develop some proactive technique to perhaps flush the offender out, maybe have him uh, or her inject themselves into the police investigation uh, you know, somehow. So, and then even we assist the, the prosecutors. Uh, once a trial is, is formed, they, they may bring you in uh, what would be the best way, John, to cross-examine uh, this the subject if he takes a stand? You know those types of things. So it's a uh, it's a whole array and of of different services providing. Uh, but like I said, when I first started this, it was just survi- a survival mode, just to be a good instructor. And I did become a good instructor. But then eventually, within a year or two, um, after I came back at Quantico at age 32, by the time I was 34, I was pretty much uh, out of the instructional uh, side and and just doing the uh, the investigative operational side of the house. You know, I think the related question is why do people continue to read or watch or and I think the the response is that true crime is really about the human condition. Uh, it's what we all face. It's what we all experience going through life. But it's the human condition writ large at the extremes. We all have these emotions of love, hate, jealousy, revenge, right. etc. But the people that John and his uh, colleagues have dealt with, they're all narcissistic. They don't have any filters. They don't have any uh, 
any restraints. Uh, they are willing to kill other people just to satisfy their own uh, cruel and perverse uh, desires. And why people do the things they do, which is what John's career has been all about, I think is is endlessly fascinating. No doubt. Both of you, and, and John uh, especially, you've spent a career uh, hunting the hunters, you know, people that stalk their prey. Uh, one of the things that befuddles me in looking at cases is how do you investigate a, a person that vanishes without a trace? What would be some of the advice and consultation that you would pass along, John, for those families of those victims or even for law enforcement that's looking for people that uh, just simply vanish with perhaps no clues? Pretty much you, you really have to focus in on, on the victimology. It's, you know, it's the why. Why is this person missing? Uh, you know, what's going on in this person's you know, life? Was the victim a victim of opportunity or was the victim you know, it was the victim, uh, you know, targeted. So usually, you know, there's a, a clue somewhere in there. But if it's a case where, where it's a total stranger, stranger uh, on stranger here, it's it's going to be, it's going to be very very difficult uh, for law enforcement. Particularly uh, today, we have uh, police agencies over 17,000 different police agencies in the United States, and and even after all the technology that's been developed, we still don't always communicate very well together. Uh, while in the FBI, and they still have it today, there's a program called the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program called VICAP, and, and uh, who, uh, who was developed by a man named uh, Pierce, uh, Detective Pierce from the LAPD, and he came and worked with us, and we developed this, but, but it's a voluntary program, and so therefore it does no good if, uh, it's say, Austin, Texas is participating in the program, and, and Dallas you know, is not. And that's the situation that you, you have today. And so you really can, because of that, and so many different police agencies who are not necessarily you know, on the same page communicating with, with one another, you can get away with uh, murder. And, and these abductions uh, you know, makes it extremely difficult for law enforcement. In our morgues in the United States, I know when I was in the Bureau, it was tens of thousands of unidentified dead in, in morgues. We don't even know who these people are. So it's difficult. There's no, there's no easy answer. Victimology. Explain for our audience what do you mean by that. It would be like going to a doctor, and the doctor is having you ask questions for patient history. It wants to know everything about you, your height, your weight, you know, if you have any uh, illnesses, you're on prescriptions. Victimology, pretty much doing the same thing. Uh, you're trying to, through your investigation, find out the strengths, the weaknesses of this, uh, you know, of this individual. You know, why? Why was this victim the victim of a particular violent crime? So pretty much my experience when I, when I looked at cases, oftentimes the investigation is weak. It's weak in the victimology side. So you have to have them go back, whether it's FBI or, or police, you have to go back and, and dig deeper and get, you know, get more information. Because, again, that's, there's going to be a clue there, and we have to you know, try to uh, dig up that clue by being a little bit more deeper and better in those uh, background investigations. For example, you have, say, uh, someone, we'll make it a female, driving down an interstate highway, runs out of gasoline, and you do an analysis of that victim. That victim was a low-risk victim. There's nothing in, in the background of her that w- would have uh, made her the victim of a violent crime. But we find out that she ran out of fuel you know, on this highway, and it appears that uh, someone came by, picked her up, because now we find her body miles away and the victim has been mur- murdered. So how we write this up is that this victim was a very low, low risk victim until she decided or was offered this ride to go in this vehicle where she did not know who the, the driver was. So she increased her risk level from low to high. And because of that, and because of the being an outdoor case, uh, outdoor cases make it even more difficult than indoor cases uh, for the gathering collection of, you know, the collection of forensic evidence. It's going to be a difficult case to uh, solve. And we've had cases of, of uh, interstate truck drivers going across lines and picking up women at various uh, stops, truck stops, and we find bodies miles and miles away. It's extremely difficult to solve those cases. Oftentimes it's because a, a mistake has been made by the offender. Uh, forensic evidence is making things better for us. DNA uh, has gotten so much better. 
but those are difficult, very difficult cases. And profiling but some you of them can really... be solved. Um, one of your earlier cases, Stephen Pinnell in was Pennsylvania, I think, truck driver, and you really nailed that one. Yeah, but he was just he stayed pretty much uh, Pinnell in the Philadelphia area. Excuse me, it was Wilmington, Delaware, with him. Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. He stayed in, in a pretty much a geographic area, and the victims were all around these construction sites, and the victims were women looking for money and money for sex and the victims were his thing was to torture his victims prior to killing him so it was easy we knew we knew our the background the profile was really going to be good but let's catch him now so what we did is we set up a decoy along an interstate where these these victims had been abducted and murdered and we had a police officer out there and and we, we believed that the vehicle would be a van because most of these guys will use vans nowadays, commercial types of vans. And so he pulls up uh, alongside of our, our decoy and she opens the door and she's talking with him and she sees he really fits the description that we did in the analysis. And then she scrapes some fibers from the carpet because we had fiber evidence in some of the victims. And then she, she obviously does not decide to go with him, takes the evidence, we go to the lab, we end up matching the fiber evidence and then we bring him in for uh, an interrogation, and we're able to link him to about five cases. And I testified in that case, and, and uh, it was their first serial murder case in Delaware. And the defense was trying to say, how can you tie these cases in together? They're all so different. And I said, yes, they're different. The victims were tortured differently. Uh, but the bottom line is, is torture, and that's a signature. And the signature in a crime is something that is more of a ritual, it's something that is not unnecessary. If you want to rape the victim, go ahead and rape her. We rape, kill, rape, kill, go ahead and do it. But when you see something that's being done to the victim that is unnecessary for the overall commission of the crime, we have that signature. And you can testify to that in court, that you know it's your opinion that whoever is responsible for these crimes did them all because of the reasons that you could have set forth. In the case of Pinnell, it was torture. I think the Stephen Pinnell case is an example of how behavioral profiling and criminal investigative analysis can work hand in hand with traditional police work and with evidence collection. That's how you get from the victim to the criminal. That's right. Yes. And the thing about it, uh, too, Fred, you know, a lot of times you show us you know, are misportraying the, my old unit. When you get back to Quantico and you start getting involved in these cases, you're not kicking down doors anymore. You <laughs> you are a, a coaching. You're coaching police. You're you're guiding them in an investigation, not taking over their investigation. And they're going to be the ones to solve the case. You're just a tool, another tool they can use potentially, you know, in their toolbox. But when you see some of these shows, you know, where we're taking over investigations, we're kicking down doors, we're pulling, pulling out our weapon you know, every other episode. That's not, you know, that's not uh, the role of, of me nor the people that worked in the unit. Uh, you come up with this analysis, it's a lot of pressure. You don't screw it up in your analysis. Right. Hopefully the information being fed to you is good information because if it's bad information, it's good to make the, the analysis uh, a bad one potentially. We'll get back to John Douglas, Mark Olshaker, and Fred Burton in just a moment. John Douglas is an expert at explaining the unexplainable and making information not just digestible, but actionable. His work solving seemingly unsolvable crimes epitomizes the concept that advanced intelligence and expert awareness are critical to success. Stratfor analysts keep corporate security leaders up to date on geopolitical developments so they can keep their focus on identifying, anticipating, and mitigating risks to their people, assets, and interests around the world. If you're not already a Stratfor member, you can learn more at stratfor.com enterprise. Now back to John Douglas, Mark Olshaker, and Fred Burton. Who are some of the high-profile people that you have interviewed over the years? I know uh, in, in looking through the story, it's, it's like the who's who of, uh, of serial killers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's just um, we started off when, when we were in California because there's so many potential you know, ones out, out there. And, and I certainly I wanted to interview Kemper at Kemper, who killed his grandparents. He killed... You know, half a dozen or so coes kills his mother, kills his mother's neighbor. Uh, but he was being discussed a lot by Quantico. But there, but again, the facts of the the agent instructors were not. They didn't. They did. 
didn't know all the facts and they were being challenged. So I definitely wanted to interview him, and uh, which I did at Vacaville, big guy, six foot nine, wow. uh, 300, uh, 300 pounds, uh, 145 IQ. I tell people his IQ is the equivalent of my IQ and my partner's IQ, <laughs> <laughs> combined, uh, combined IQ. He was, I never felt intimidated. People say, are you, are you intimidated? No, I never felt intimidated because basically he was a coward, committing cowardly types of crimes. And being as big as he was, he still uh, was bullied in school you know, him, himself. So Kemper was one that we interviewed, uh, Manson and the Manson family members and Richard Speck and you know, just uh, David Berkowitz. I mean, just you know, son of Sam. Yes, yeah, son of Sam. Uh, a lot of ones that you, you may never even have heard of. And then we had... John Gacy, and then then a fellow in my unit, we sent him down to do uh, Ted, you know Ted Bundy, uh, at the, just before he was uh, you know executed. But as we were doing, as you see, by doing these interviews, it just got you better. You really had a feel and a sense for the work that you're doing it, and on these cases. Not that that all, these cases all, are all going to be exactly the same, but you start walking in the shoes and in the mind of of the perpetrators, and then we started to have some successes in the beginning and we started off the first year with 59 cases and then the next year it doubled and then it kept doubling and then quadrupling and then we had a we brought in more agents to for me to train the only reason they did that is because by the time i'm 38 years of age i nearly die on the green river murder case in in seattle washington i collapsed in my hotel room at age 38 i have viral encephalitis i'm in a coma for a week, I developed blood clots. Which, in fact, is the opening scene yeah. of, My the, of our first book, Mind Hunter. Yeah. yeah. And you see a little bit of that now in the Mind Hunter show with anxiety, uh, holding forward, having uh, this anxiety. Although I was not quite the basket case he, he was with the anxiety, but, but it happened just before I got sick up in New York City where I was training a couple of hundred police back then. John, did you ever work on the... And Fred, uh, I think what's important, what's important here, Fred, is that... Uh, Unlike previous FBI work, which was, you know, we characterized just the facts, ma'am, under the under the Hoover administration, what John did uh, started bringing in a very emotional component because, uh, you know, you could say, well, in fact, all the characters based on John in, in fiction and on television, they say, well, does he he has this rare gift or or is it a curse that he can think like a criminal? Well, we kind of laugh at that because we say if you can't think like a criminal, you shouldn't be a detective or an FBI agent to begin with. But it's being able to put the pieces together is the trick. And one of those pieces is getting inside the victim's head and understanding what the victim went through. And in a lot of cases, even since we've started writing, we have very, very close relationships with the families of murder victims. and. That really takes its toll. I think it was in Mindhunter that we talked about. I mean, John can go could go into the woods with his kids, and he'd say, and it would you know be a very pastoral scene until he thought, yeah, this reminds me of the one where we uh, pulled the kid out of the uh, that stream. Yeah. So, and John, I mean, you even had people uh, on staff around there t to deal with that kind of stress, didn't you? Oh yeah. Well, then after I nearly died, I came back and I was pretty much. Uh, not ordered, but I went to stress psychologist. I was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, it's hard not to uh, to carry a lot of this home with you. To really to do the job correctly, you really have to uh, get in emotionally involved with what happened with the victim, uh, the offender, uh, and 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 try to to visualize in, in your mind that and feel for that. So it's unlike where, where you're trying to develop isolation of affect where you're trying to cut yourself off from emotion you really you really kind of sense and feel the emotion but it, it emotionally drains you at the end of the, of the day by being really sick and almost dying I, I think it made me a better leader because when I had these uh, some great people working you know in the unit I could see and observe that they were starting to be affected like I was and I would be uh, against the, the bureau rules of uh, by sending these people home and I, I cover to them and you're not supposed to do that in the bureau but i wanted to take care of the, the people because we it takes this emotional toll on you know on you uh, but it's very rewarding and then you got to see the pressure of of doing this you don't you didn't and particularly in the early days we didn't have the, the support of the bureau right and people are wanting you to fail some some may even be wishing you 
you to fail. And then when you get successful, people aren't or don't always look at that as, as oh, that's really great. It's great for Douglas. It's great for the, the FBI. Some people, he, he's getting too famous or he's getting uh, too much publicity. And I, I never was looking for publicity. The only time I did publicity was to benefit an investigation, you know, to help, uh, you know, solve the case. Yeah, no doubt. I, I know from being a former uh, special agent myself that at times we're our own worst enemies. Uh, John, I've got to ask you, uh, back in the day, uh, I grew up in the D.C. area. We had a uh, famous uh, mass murderer, a, a former State Department Foreign Service officer by the name of Bradford Bishop, who murdered his entire family with a hammer. Did you ever work on that case? Oh, yeah. That was one. It was, they still haven't solved that case. No. Uh, who knows? He may be dead you know, by now. Uh, but I'm trying some of the details. Yeah, they, I think he, he took his wife. Wasn't it like North Carolina? They found her in a burner in a pit or something. Or oh, it was. Evidence. Right. Uh, he murdered his family with a hammer to include his sleeping yeah. children and his mother. And uh, he put them all in the back of his, I think it was a 74 Chevrolet station wagon with uh, Leo the dog. Sounds right. And drove, right, right. yeah, drove yeah. to North Carolina, buried the bodies, and set them on fire. Then fled yeah. to the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, where his vehicle was recovered, and he, he's never been found. And in, in, in reality, uh, recently he was an FBI top ten fugitive, but they took him off the list. So I was just curious if you ever worked on that case, since it was somewhat personal. Yeah, well, what's very interesting about that case, yeah. Fred, is you know oh. that John did fugitive assessment he also he also worked on a case um um of a guy named john list oh and yeah interestingly enough they were within a few years of each other both did exactly the same thing we wrote about yeah. this in our book anatomy of motive and john worked on both cases uh john list all, uh, was an accountant uh, bradford bishop was a state department employee foreign service officer and both of them killed their mothers and wives and children uh and fled and they would seem to be identical crimes yet when john started looking into them he found out the personalities and the motives were completely different. And uh, so you can have something that looks exactly the same, but unless you know what you're doing, unless you are steeped in criminology and understanding uh, the minds of the victims, uh, you think these are similar cases, and yet they were completely different. And John predicted that List would eventually be caught, which he was, uh, said that because of Bradford Bishop's personality, his ability to blend in at other places, his uh, his proficiency in other languages, that he would be much more difficult to catch than he was. He certainly certainly has been. Uh, It's hard not to turn on... uh television or, or look at the internet to date without uh, seeing all these mass shooting and mass casualty attacks. Any any thoughts on, on how that might, uh, from a profiling perspective, when you're looking at these mass shooters, uh, we write a lot about it here, we talk a lot about it. What's your thoughts in general from, is there any baseline with these individuals if, if you were doing these, or would you have to look at them on an individual basis? You want to answer, start, and I'll fill in, Mark? Go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, we have to start off with the fact that serial killers, they're completely different from uh, the kind of mass murderers that you're talking about. Serial killers and predators, they expect to walk away from the crime. They expect their victims to die, not themselves. These mass murderers, they are generally playing an end game. They will generally either kill themselves, expect to to be shot, or what we call suicide, by cop. Uh, There are a lot of uh, uh, red flag behaviors, but there's a lot of red flag behaviors from uh, people who don't do these things. Uh, I think we can say without fear of contradiction that these are people who have both the sense of tremendous narcissism, that they can do whatever they want, and that they are entitled, but at the same time, they have very low self-esteem, they have deep-seated sense of inadequacy, and if you then allow them to get with guns, that's a very dangerous combination. I'm going to throw this to John and say that if he gets to interview any of these people who do survive, we'll we'll learn a lot. Uh, But we don't get to interview many of them because they don't end up alive from it. These personalities, like Mark just described, too, when you put them in a, 
a, a big school, 2,000 students in many of these cases here. Uh, they're kind of lost, uh, these asocial, not so much antisocial, asocial loners. Uh, they don't fit in with any specific group. They get become obsessed with violent themes, whether it's from video games. And it's, it's not to say video games cause them to commit crimes. It's just it's just fuel. It's just fuel for the fire, fuels the you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the fantasy of these people. So I don't know, my wife's a school teacher on how she'll see and other teachers will see clues, but, uh, or indicators, but it's just a lot of times they, they just are, they, they just are so busy. They just, you know, where do they go with the information? Uh, some teachers too, they don't, don't want to necessarily get that, get involved. But when, when a crime like this happens, you start digging in, into the uh, into the case, you you find that the parents certainly saw some indicators, uh, behavioral problems with their son. They were indicators in the school, but it's so difficult um, unless you're someone says, okay, let's take a look at this guy here, uh, and then you say, well, this guy potentially has it could be a problem. Let's bring him in. We'll, let's talk to him. Um, it's not going to happen. It's just uh, unfortunately, we we'll always have to be alert for this, but. I don't know if we'll ever be able to solve that that problem. And let me throw out one that's very controversial for you guys, and uh, like to to know if you'd want to take a stab at it. We we still don't have a motive, for example, with the Las Vegas shooter. What what's your thoughts about that? I think we'd have to know a lot more about him personally. I think we can uh, we can certainly say that he was a narcissist. We can certainly say that he felt entitled to take other people's lives. That he felt a sense of power. But in terms of uh, his background, uh, there aren't a lot of indicators, uh, are there, John? No, but I was just talking to someone the other day, and I heard that he had he had some huge financial losses too within uh, the casinos, you know, out there. But you see, why not go after the casino, the owners or, or the people right. working there? Uh, it's just dis- displaced anger. But it's kind of like displaced anger when you have an offender who who's been abused as a child and, and uh, or neglected in some way, you know, rather than go at the particular person, say within the family uh, or the wife, perhaps they displace it and they go after, uh, go after strangers. And, and uh, that's, that's the problem with, with something like, uh, you know, like that. Uh, and with easy access to, uh, to high powered uh, yeah. guns, uh, that that gives them this this sense of ultimate power. I mean, it almost we almost go back to that old saying from the old West that uh, God made all men and Samuel Colt made all men equal. And unfortunately, uh, with our gun culture today, that's one of the things that uh, we have to face. I thank you both for the work that you have done, uh, John. Uh, I, I certainly uh, thank you for your service. You were an inspiration to to many of us young agents and. Uh, um, I thank, thank you for I thank you for all the work you've done uh, on this and and helping. Uh, I know that as you will say, there is no closure for families of uh, murder victims. Exactly but, right. Uh, mm-hmm. um, your your heart's in the right place, and you certainly uh, have done groundbreaking work. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Fred. Thanks for joining us for this conversation with Fred Burton, John Douglas, and Mark Olshaker. We'll have details about The Killer Across the Table, as well as Fred Burton's latest, Beirut Rules, and geopolitical analysis from Stratfor in the show notes. If you're interested in learning how Stratfor can help your business, be sure to visit stratfor.com slash enterprise. We'd love to hear your suggestions about who Fred Burton should interview next. Please send your ideas to podcast at stratfor.com. Feel free to leave a review on the podcast page in iTunes or wherever you listen. For more geopolitical intelligence and links to our content, follow us on Twitter at Stratfor. I'm Faisal Pervez. Thanks for listening.